Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio. Lunchtime talk. Uh, these talks are live every Friday at 1 p.m., both here in the building and live online. Hi, online. Uh, so whether you're in Bristol or you're far away, you can join in the conversation. My name's Martin O'Leary. I am the studio community lead here. I'm a white man in my late 30s, long hair and a beard, wearing a baby blue woolly jumper. Uh, every Friday, we throw open the doors of the Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday, where we offer you the chance to spend some time in the space, hot desk alongside our residents and staff from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So, especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio. Can anyone who's new to the studio put your hand up? Welcome. Got a few today. Um, this is the first time you're engaging with us. This bit is for you. What is the Pervasive Media Studio? We're a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, where we are right now, uh, we are right now, you are at home, uh, University of the West of England and the University of Bristol, and we're funded by Arts Council England. And we offer studio space, desks, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free to our residents, as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And most of all, we're a space for people to take risks in their practice, with embryonic ideas and to make room for collaboration. So quick bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, feel free to move around and grab a cup of tea or coffee from the kitchen, glass of water. Uh, please don't use the microwave, it interferes with the induction loop system. Um, we have a quiet space just through here to my left, your right. Uh, if you need to take a break at any point, just pop in there. Uh, fire exits are at either end of the studio on the far end. So if you hear a fire alarm, we will direct you that way. Uh, hopefully we won't. Uh, and there are accessible toilets, and I don't see any babies, but there, are, there is baby change available in the little space uh, just there next to the kitchen. Uh, there'll be a Q&A at the end of the second talk today, so we're split into two talks, but we'll hold all the questions till the end. Uh, those of you who are watching online can pop your questions into the YouTube chat. If you're here in person, just stick your hand in the air. We'll send a microphone around. Uh, you can get news on all of our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio at mastodon.social on Mastodon, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. Now, before we start, we do want to let you know there is no talk next week. It's bank holiday. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time with a talk from me uh, about some of the work we've been doing reimagining application processes for our winter residencies. It is more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> uh, but today, our talk is part of the Control Shift Feeling Machines Weekender. So to introduce that program and to tell you about our speakers, I'm going to hand you over to Becca Rose. Mm. Hi, everyone. Um, so, um, hello everyone, uh, really great to see so many of you here today. Um, I'm Becca Rose, um, I'm a white woman um, wearing a black top and glasses. Um, and I'm Martha, also one of the Control Shift uh, producers, and I'm a white woman, uh, short, with short hair in her mid-30s. Oh yes, I didn't mention that. We're both uh, Control Shift producers, and before we get going uh, with brilliant artists, uh, Chloe and Julia today, we're just going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with Control Shift um, this weekend. Um, so we're really excited to be um, uh, holding a kind of weekender event called Feeling Machines. Um, and we, um, as a company, are a collective of producers, artists, um, and researchers. And we've curated this program. Um, I have, Martha King has, Rod Dickinson and Coral Manton, who aren't here today. Um, to kind of explore different ways to engage with arts and technology. Um, we've also had support from a brilliant team, Alison uh, Cryan, Ruby Myers, Irene Papadimitriou from Future Everything has been one of our mentors, as well as Jaslyn Pinkney, who's been our inclusion mentor, um, thanks to funding from the studio development grant here. Um, and we've also had design from Saren Spooner. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for being involved. Last night we had um, an algo rave and thank you for coming to that as well. Um, so basically uh, our mission is to kind of um, celebrate kind of computational arts and explore um, the kind of messy spaces between humans and machines and nature. Um, and we, we do this by bringing people together to reimagine re the relationship that we have with technology. And we do this through arts and through a dialogue uh, with arts um, and we kind of started out in the middle of the pandemic um, when we produced um, our first event which was control shift in 2020 
Um, and this program provided a different lens and approaches to explore how we connect digitally in that time. And we put on workshops, discussions, installations, and screenings, um, which explored kind of reframing, uh, re uh, demystifying and transforming our relationships with technology through arts. Um, and this was actually a hybrid program, including online kind of COVID restricting uh, events um, in real life in Bristol, um, and also um, online spaces. And we also um, put works on in kind of uh, shopping centers and with the Bristol Central Library. Um, in that time, it kind of worked quite well to kind of collaborate with partners in that way. I'm going to hand over to Martha. Thanks, Becca. Um, so this year, we're exploring the theme of feeling machines. And we've been running and supporting a program of artist residencies, commissions, and public workshops since October 2022. Um, and the program has taken a deep dive into the sticky, messy, fluffy ways that we live our lives with machines. In a time when phone apps define who our friends and lovers are, when AI become artists and algorithms decide the music that moves us, we wanted to explore what it feels like to feel with machines. Um, so we are concluding this program since, that's been going since the autumn with this weekender. Um, and we launched this last night, as Becca said, with an algorithm. So yeah, thanks to those of you who came and watched some performers from all over the country, live coding music and visuals. Um, and tomorrow, we're hosting a full day of artist walks, drop-in workshops, and installations at St. Anne's House. Um, just got another slide I might go to there. Uh, on the slide, there's just a few uh, images which represent some of the kinds of activities you might be experiencing if you come down on Saturday. Um, and that day is all about exploring the messy ways that we live between these physical and digital worlds. And then we also have an amazing film, which is the Data Institute of De Technological Consciousness, which is a kind of fictional institute. And it's a really, really beautiful film made by some South African artists. And that will be screening on loop at the Arnolfini in their main auditorium over the whole weekend. So you can just go in any time and, and watch and experience that. And alongside it will be displayed some objects. Um, yeah, so the Feeling Machines theme to us feels really important now because of the way that computers are so present, computers, machines, technology, so present in our lives. Um, and a lot of the ways that they are present is often really intimate, whether that's through personal emotions, embodied data being tracked, sensed, collected, the way that we communicate and share emotions remotely through these kind of sometimes quite cold objects, um, and sometimes how we can feel very exploited alienated by big tech. So with the Feeling Machines program, we're not trying to say that these relationships we have with machines are good or bad. We don't want to create judgment. We're more looking to explore and question the tensions where these textured, intimate spaces meet the digital machines and also bring to light different perspectives on it to open up spaces for you to explore, play, learn, and discover. Uh, which leads me to introduce the artists um, who we've, com who've both, we've commissioned to create new work for the program, um, which is Julia Carlo Rossi and Chloe Meinek. Um, Julia Carlo Rossi is a curator and digital artist interested in researching and using digital tools for archival and storytelling purposes. Her interests include digital preservation, esoteric programming languages, interactive narrative, net art and visual poetry. In her creative work, she uses digital tools to create storytelling experiences that explore language, queerness, and archival practices. Um, Chloe Meinek, who's also a resident here at the studio, is an artist, co-designer, researcher, and queer community builder. She specializes in actual and authentic co-design with different groups of people and communities. Through her design studio, she has, um, mental, she has designed mental health tools, products, public services, public art, government system, systems, and organizations all for social good. She specializes in inclusive and accessible design processes, and her work follows themes of care, repair, and identity. Chloe co-founded Bristol Butch Bar and co-facilitates Queer Death Cafe. So I'll hand you over to these artists now to share more about their practice and their new works. 
which you can experience at St. Anne's House tomorrow. Um, and they're responding to the themes of the programme. So I'll hand you over to Julia now. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Martha. And thank you, everyone, for coming online and in person. Um, yeah, so I'm Giulia Carlarossi. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm a white woman in my 30s. Uh, I have longish brown hair and blue dyed tips. And today I'm wearing a long blue dress and red lipstick. And yeah, I'm here today to talk about um, my creative practice and as well as how I responded to the feeling machines prompt. Um, and specifically, how do we feel through machines and how do machines kind of mediate and shape our modern relationships? So just a bit of background to kind of uh, contextualize where I come from, just two pictures of myself. Um, so I work as a curator for digital publications at the British Library, uh, where I kind of help the library to manage their collection of complex digital publications which is things that can include um, interactive narratives as well as things like mobile apps, for example. Uh, but I'm also a part-time uh, student in a master in computational arts at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, so I'm interested in kind of creating these sort of types of digital publication as well as preserving them, which, yeah, brings me to kind of my research and creative interests, which um, revolve around digital preservation and kind of preserving formats that might be a risk of obsolescence and of disappearing if um, an adequate preservation strategy is not really implemented. But I'm also personally interested in creative coding, as Becca mentioned, um, especially physical computing. So it's kind of creative computational artworks that have a software side to them, but also a physical component. And um, I'm especially interested in kind of the interaction that an audience might have with this work. And something else that is um, kind of a recurring theme in my practice are archives because of my job, uh, but also I'm very interested um, as a queer woman in how queer lives are included or often excluded from archives. Um, and also about how archiving practices can be queered. So a few examples of um, things I worked on in the past. Um, so the Digital Archivist was a video game that I created as part of my master uh, at Goldsmiths. And it's focused on digital preservation and kind of uses this um, webcam that is positioned at the very top of this kind of mock-up archival desk. Um, and the webcam is combined with a color tracking algorithm, so it kind of follows the player's movement and the controller is um, a very colorful floppy disk that you're using to um, kind of preserve formats as they're falling from the top of the screen. Um, so the goal is to kind of achieve the highest score possible. And, and yeah, this work was inspired by my interest in long-term preservation. Uh, of both software and hardware, but um, especially the concept of digital dark age, which is this idea that um, future generations might um, lack historical information as well as access to digital formats that have become obsolete and inaccessible in the future. Um, so yeah, this was one of them. And another project I worked on, um, quite a different project from the previous one, uh, but kind of still focused on archives and archival material uh, was folded time. This was a physical computing project um, also created for my masters. Um, it's an interactive artwork that um, explores the conce concepts of fold of time and kind of queer temporality through personal archives. Um, so the audience is confronted with this sort of installations. Um, and if you're as old as I am, you kind of, if you find a little music cassette with a pen in it, my instinct would be to kind of rewind the cassette. And that's the idea that I hope the audience will have. So basically, as you turn the pen anti-clockwise, you're rewinding the cassette. As, as the cassette rewinds, the video in the VHS um, tape also rewinds. And the video footage is all made of uh, childhood videos of myself from age 
uh, 10 to 1, because uh, it's going backwards. Uh, and basically, as long as someone is rewinding the tape, the video keeps playing and looping and kind of folding time onto itself. Um, so it, it kind of plays on with this idea of re revisiting one's past and uh, one's history uh, through my own current understanding of myself uh, and my queer identity as well. So in terms of responding to the prompt of feeling machines, oh yeah, there it is. Um, I came up with a few main points and kind of questions that I wanted to attend to with the piece I made. Um, I'm drawing from a rich history of male correspondence between queer women as kind of a mode of expressing romantic feelings. So in the past, queer women um, were often unable to make lives together and kind of writing letter was a mode to keep in touch from the different places they were situated in. And um, obviously at this point of time, and at least in certain countries, this is quite different. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight was that um, in the pandemic, all of us uh, had to communicate in different ways and often heavily rely on digital tools to kind of keep in touch. So I was thinking about kind of queer women having to find other forms of correspondence during the pandemic to stay in touch, as well as um, the roles of machines and digital tools in kind of facilitating this type of communication. So the piece I made is called Keeping in Touch, uh, Lesbian Dating During a Global Pandemic, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's an interactive narrative uh, which can be read online, but it also has some physical computing components that kind of add to the experience. Um, it revolves around queer pandemic dating and using online forms of communications to keep in touch while physically distanced. Um, and in the narrative, you follow uh, the two main characters, first meeting online and then keeping in touch through the span of a year. Uh, it combines my personal experience of finding love during a pandemic, as well as extracts from historical correspondence between queer women. And the main narrative was created using Twine, uh, which um, you might know, but is an open source tool for writing interactive narratives. And the physical computing elements um, kind of combine e-textile, so um, electronic textile um, using a touch board and conductive thread to kind of create a touch activated kind of sonic installation, uh, as well as a lot of crafting. So this quote uh, from Matters of Care by Maria Puig de la Bella Casa was also a source of inspiration for the project. Um, so in this chapter titled Touching Visions, she talks about uh, how computers can be existential companions for people trying to keep in touch with dislocated networks of loved ones um, and how touch, touch technologies and longings of being in touch match quite well. Um, so this was one of the things that kind of sparked the main idea of touching technologies and the digital interfaces we touch kind of every day as keeping in touch with loved ones. Um, here are some pictures of some of the books I used to research my project. So on the left, yes, uh, there's a pile of books mostly about letters or um, archival material between queer women. Uh, including No Modernism Without Lesbians, uh, Letters from Tove, Yoki Eroichi, My Autobiography of Carson McCullers, The Letters of Ida Sackville West to Virginia Woolf and Dear Juliet. Mm -hmm. And on the right, um, there is some queer poems, uh, queer poetry books that I also used in my narrative uh, by June, Jer June Jordan, Mary Oliver, uh, Natalie Diaz and Mary Jean Chan. And I also wanted to use different platform designs uh, in my narrative to kind of show how communication usually happens across different platforms and tools. Um, and I also wanted to um, incorporate um, different types of content. So things like tarot cards and horoscopes, um, poems, photos of press flowers to make it in almost like um, a scrapbook experience of the, of the pandemic. And I chose some recurring 
imagery um, that I use throughout the narrative. So there's a lot of hands to kind of reinforce the idea of touch, obviously, but um, also as a common kind of lesbian symbol, as well as flowers, especially violets, again, for the kind of historical ties with lesbians and lesbian culture. And in terms of incorporating the more haptic elements uh, of the piece, I wanted to have uh, components that kind of would reinforce the tactile experience. So I created a frame, I um, don't know if you can see it, um, with a Sappho fragment um, reading Someone Will Remember Us, I Say Even in Another Time, which is um, a translation by Anne Carson of uh, fragment 147, I think. Uh, and the word remember is embroidered uh, using conductive thread so that when you touch it, a song starts, um, which was written and sung by my partner. Um, and with the mouse as well, I wanted to kind of continue with the idea of flowers and hands together. Um, and I found this great mouse um, that I wanted to use and incorporate in some way. Um, so I thought the idea of the kind of pixelated cursor hand uh, as a digital hand transported into the physical realm was great. Um, so I kind of enhanced it with a flower as well as um, some soft fabric to kind of uh, reinforce the kind of tactility of the mouse. And I think they should start playing the video. So yeah, if you touch it again, it'll stop. And then the mouse, just to show that it's very soft <laughs> and nice to touch. Yeah, so where can you play it? Um, so the online version is freely available at the link on the slide um, that will take you to the website each.io. Um, but if you're in Bristol and you're coming to the Filling Machine Weekender tomorrow um, at St. Anne's House, yeah, then you can also play with the frame and the mouse. So please do come. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Did I do it wrong? No, you're going to be good. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. That was a great talk. I think we should collaborate. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, all my work fits into the themes of like care, repair, identity, and who are you? Um, I can't see the slideshow on the computer. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so this is my type of practice. So um, kind of before the pandemic, I did a lot of this. So co-design, equitable design. Um, I facilitated lots with people with lived experience to create like mental health and wellbeing tools and products. Um, and I've always had like my own personal uh, practice, which is around like meaning of objects, uh, their value, their stories. Um, I make objects myself um, and I run lots of creative workshops making zines um, and I do lots around like the history of queer zines. Um, and then this big yellow bit is what I'm focusing on now. So queer community building, um, working with those communities to co-create art projects. Um, and moving on to like activism and design justice. Um, so I co-run Bristol Butch Bar with my friend Rosie, um, and it's to celebrate butchness across the queer community. Um, it's trans and non-binary celebratory. Um, and yeah, it's become quite a big thing, with, like hundreds of people coming each month. Um, we go to protests. Um, there's lots of craft in it. So I run Craft Corner for shy people. Um, and we make zines. We do poetry. Um, we've got this thing called Butchcraft, which is where you go to the forest and you learn how to make a fire. Um, we go on cinema trips, school trips. Um, 
this is the community zine that I helped make. Um, and I also run um, with two friends, Polly and Yoni, um, Queer Death Cafe. So this is like a safe place for queer people to talk about loss and grief, because unfortunately there's a hell of a lot of loss and grief um, within queerness. Um, and again, we like use craft, so um, we use like clay to talk through things, um, and we might make a zine, and we also uh, go for walks. Um, uh, so, um, thinking about this project, thinking about like objects, um, I always come back to these, which are the love tokens that you can see at the Foundling Museum. So they're bits of cloth that are kind of the mums of the babies. They ripped off their shirts or dresses and they attached them to the babies. And it was um, meant to be when they could look after their babies, they'd return with their bit of cloth. Um, and you can see them at the Foundling Museum. It's a cry fest. Um, if you want to cry, go there. Um, but yeah, also the idea that um, the children actually never owned their bit of fabric. Um, they were put in like a museum. So it's like detachment, I guess. Physical objects are awesome. I couldn't sum it up other than that. Um, <laughs> and like I always use objects um, to talk between people. Uh, I find them like a really good way of bridging gaps. Um, throughout my work, I've worked lots with people living with dementia and made kind of family trees of objects. Um, this is my queer family uh, in objects. Uh, so when I think of people, I think of objects related to that person. Uh, it's my wife's butter. Um, <laughs> Unsalted. Um, yes, yeah, so these are all really important people to me. Um, and then this like kind of leads on to kind of this project. So I've collected all my phones that I've ever owned uh, from when I was like 10. Uh, I don't know why, but I like really value them. Um, and the, this project is around like, do we love our phones? Because people often say they love their phones, but the actual object itself, I think, is kind of void of emotion. Um, and like, how would we act differently if we did love our phones? Um, so it's sort of a personal look at my phones. So this is the first phone I owned, uh, which is Nokia 5110, 5110. Um, and it was a family phone, so we shared the phone. Um, and I remember taking it to a school trip to the Millennium Dome when I was 10. Um, so when I see it, I just think Millennium Dome. Um, and how like we shared phones uh, with family members. This was my, this is Nokia 3310, um, which I had it in year seven at school. Um, and again, it started off as a family phone. So I'd use it in the daytime and then hand it back in the evening. Um, and I opened it up recently to do this project, and I found like there's a little sticker that says Laura, that was one of my best friends. Um, <laughs> there's a trumpet because I used to play the trumpet. Um, and like this kind of era, I had a Tamagotchi. I don't know whether I owned a Furby, but I, I wanted to. Um, and I guess you can kind of look at the design of all these. Uh, and the fact that like that's got fabric and we care about it quite a lot. Tamagotchi is kind of care. Um, yeah. Uh, this was my brother's phone that I was jealous of. Um, so this you could like customize it. So you could print your own pieces of paper and then put them in the case. That I used to think was pretty cool. Uh, these are the Sony Ericsson hand-me-down years. So. They went from my dad to my brother to me, so I had all these phones for the last like couple of months of their lives. Um, I don't actually own this one. It's not in my collection, but I really remember using this toggle, just there. Um, I didn't own this. <laughs> I was jealous. Um, so another person called Chloe at school that was very popular had this phone. Um, and I always remember being like, oh, look at the shape. <laughs> um, 
Uh, this is another Sony Ericsson. This was one of my favorite phones. Um, so it had a Walkman. It was the first like MP3 player with a phone. And I had this for quite a few years, but I remember going to uni with this phone. And often, like I'm like six or seven years behind the latest <laughs> model. Um, so then at uni, I was doing design and craft. Like I learned about the importance of objects and materials, and I started kind of designing tangible interfaces. So this was a project that I did. So you'd pull. That would be um, a piece of audio about the world. This would be about a person. This would be about an event in your life. Um, and thinking about like the shape of how things are designed, uh, treasuring objects. OK, so this is for the project. I collected all my phones, went to my parents' house, dug out all my phones. There's a few missing, but I think I've worked out that I've had, I'm now on my 14th phone in 22 years, because uh, I started having a phone when I was 10. So I'm 32 now, and I think my collection is quite small compared to most people's because, yeah, I don't know how many phones you think you've owned. Some people like Taryn's probably like three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and like through this process, obviously this slide, you can't see any of the stories attached. Like it's very vague. There's like no emotion. And then as you start adding stories, so like I started this process of like holding them, of trying to remember, trying to bring out the stories of them, um, why they're important, where I was living, who my friends were, who I was going out with. Um, <laughs> wait a sec. OK, so this is the order. It's a bit in the wrong order. So at uni, um, I watched this documentary called uh, Blood in the Mobile. So that, that's in back in 2010. Um, and it's all about like our phones. Every single phone, well, smartphone has a microprocessor in. And the mineral uh, tantalum comes from coltan. And it's often mined. It's often children mining it. And it's, um, yeah, most phones have conflict materials inside them. Uh, and this is what I watched when I was at uni, so for a while, I had this attached to the back of my phone. I don't know why, but it's a little book. And every time I met someone, I was like, did you know we've got this mineral in our phone? And like tried to go through the process. And sort of, because I was doing this course that was all about the importance of materials. Um, so yeah, and I had this phone when I met my wife, and she was like, what are you doing with like a book attached to your phone? <laughs> um, and then later on, I could purchase a fair phone. So my first company phone that I ha actually had like choice over, I chose a fair phone. Um, I had it from 2016 to 2018. Um, it's kind of a step in the right direction, but I actually found that it let me down quite a few times when I really needed it. Um, but I think they're better now. This was like a one of the original versions. Uh, this is a bit, a bit like your work. So um, I started selecting text messages and just writing them on a block of wood. And now I have this object, which is from like 2011. It's got some of the first texts with my wife, now wife, but that's like 13 years ago. Um, and then, yeah. So I, I'm really interested in phones. I don't know if you can tell. Um, <laughs> and like, this is your phone. So I, I always take pictures of people that have interesting phones. So this is Becca's phone from five, five, years, ago. five years ago or something. Um, and then when I owned the Fairphone, it did like, <laughs> you've had peace of mind for zero minutes, <laughs> which means you haven't interacted with your phone. So like, phones get touched so much, but the Fairphone design it designed to have more of a better relationship with it. And like my piece of my record piece of time, 1,143 minutes. I think that's like a really long sleep or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess 
thinking about them, they're the sort of the most touched objects in our lives. Um, and we have an intimate physical relationship with them, but the actual object itself, um, what's our relationship with it? Uh, I often think like uh, back in the day when phones were just part of our lives, but now they're a so much integral part of our lives. Have we ever questioned it? Um, and I was thinking like, if, if you were to get a new partner in your life, you might think about the boundaries um, that you're setting with them. And have we ever really set any boundaries with these objects? Do we love our phones? Uh, and then the last question, oh yeah, do you have an interesting phone story about the relationship with your phone? Um, so I'll be at St Anne's house on Saturday and I'm sort of gathering other people's phone stories and trying to create like a timeline. Um, yeah, that's the project. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've got plenty of time for questions. Does anyone in the room have a question? If you're watching online, stick it in the YouTube chat and Lawisham's going to pull it out. Hands up. Questions? Anybody? Funny. <laughs> it's more a case of reminiscing about archiving because I was thinking about this only the other day. When I did my university degree, which was like the end of the 70s, early 80s, I wrote my dissertation on the ZX Spectrum, which used a cassette. And I printed it out on punch side paper through a dot metric. And I was only thinking the other day, there'll be no record of that left. None, because even though the university kept a copy, and I had, a, I don't know where my copy is, and I did keep the cassette for a while, but then I threw all the cassettes out, God knows. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, that's all gone. That's all gone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 Should I stand up? For yeah. the, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. It's, um, and you know, I mean, when I talk about complex digital things, it's, and we call it also emerging formats, but you know, they're emerging now, but film was emerging at a certain point, like photography was emerging at a certain point. So it's not like we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. Like there's always been this kind of preservation issues. But the amount of things that are published online and like digitally every day, it's incredibly like compared to things in print, for example. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a challenge of being able to preserve this moment in time and this sort of digital memory that otherwise will just get lost. And it's incredible how like, you know, medial, medieval manuscripts comparatively, we can preserve quite well. Like we know how to do that. But like an app if published in 2018, it's already gone. Like, it's crazy. If I can add a little postscript. Yeah, of course. When, when I, I was doing a media studies course. And um, as I said, I <laughs> said X Spectrum because my now husband was into computers. Mm -hmm. And the rest of my year thought I had an unfair advantage because I had a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got a question? We got one from online. Uh, this is a question for Chloe from Dave Webb. <laughs> Dave asks, if you were to imagine a phone with more physical slash material presence to connect with than our shiny glass slabs, what might it be like, shape, material, or features? Um, yeah, I was thinking about this because I've obviously insulted loads of phones and then like, what's, <laughs> what's the dream? Um, I don't know, for me, I look at lots of, say, on Instagram, I look at a lot of videos of people like using their hands to do pottery, painting, um, like that physical nature. So I think that's what I'm kind of missing f for me personally. So I was thinking maybe I could have like clip on physical scroll things. I think I'm looking like I like buttons. <laughs> um, I think I'm looking for that physical interaction um, and that tactility. Um, so yeah, but it would be interesting to ask different people. I love ceramics, um, 
but a ceramic phone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have glass phones, that's stupid too. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Not sure. What would the person who asked the question have? OK, sorry. <laughs> there you went one way, I get it. Please reply, Dave. Please reply. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, just a question for Chloe. Have you reactivated the phone so you can hear the ring tone again? And what, was, what did that, if you have, what did that feel like? And if you haven't, would you like to? I haven't yet. I think most of them are like, I usually use my phone up until it, it dies. But then that's not normally, yeah. So I haven't yet. But I would have to find all the chargers. And I don't think I have all the chargers. Is, does a mobile phone museum exist anywhere? Uh, there's one online, actually, like uh, called the Mobile Phone Museum. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> but you can look up all the different models, and it's got photographs, and like it says how many were made and when it was released, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Nobody. Come on. A <laughs> <laughs> hey, question for Julia. Um, it's interesting thinking about digital preservation and, and your just comments you were just making a moment ago Ooh. made me think I removed like 50 gig of photos from my computer Ooh. the other day and put them on an external hard drive. And when I was doing it, I thought, I'm never going to look at those again. Mm. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on kind of curating our digital archives. And we obviously, mm. we probably can't preserve everything. So how do we make sure we preserve the right stuff? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Because um, I was reading an article about it as well. Because it's kind of like just two sides. I think sometimes when you put stuff to like the cloud or online in some format and you think like oh it's going to be there forever that's that's safe and then there's stories of people like being banned from their account on the cloud or you know something online can very easily be taken down or have like a link that doesn't link to the right place anymore um, but there is also the other side that is like we tend to accumulate so much stuff because it's just kind of easier and it doesn't have that same kind of physical presence and it's like, oh, it doesn't take that much space. Um, but I think, yeah, we end up with the, with the opposite problem of kind of preserving a lot of things that might not be that necessary to preserve, uh, like a lot of, yeah, pictures that I will never look at again. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the solution would be like because um, it's obviously, you know, very time consuming to go through all the amount of pictures that we take every day on the phone just because it's, you know, you don't have a film with only 27 like exposures that you can take. Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Like what I do in my daily job is kind of trying to preserve as much as possible <coughs> and very much like based on what we know we can do and what we can work around. Um, but I guess, yeah, the, it, it is quite important to think about also like when too much is too much and especially the kind of environmental impact that that also has um, of kind of having stuff on giant servers as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> it's interesting good to hear your thoughts. Chloe, I yeah. think you want to yeah. say something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so with my work with people living with dementia around like memory, so like... Um, if you want to remember something, like having an emotional connection to it, having a physical object and having a piece of music is like the kind of smell ideally, but that's really difficult to replicate. Um, but yeah, so as well as thinking of people and objects, I also say associate piece of music with them because uh, of like working for 10 years with people living dementia and like working out what's important. Um, so yeah, and like, with um, a music memory box, which is just there. It's like 10 objects. So I work with people to find those 10 objects. What are they? What are the people that they want to remember? What are the pieces of music? Um, but it's really to do with emotional connection, like wedding songs, um, that kind of thing. Anyway. Thank you both very much. <laughs>
Um, yeah. Chloe, I don't know if this is a question, but um, I was just thinking about your question around um, the relationships we have with our phones and if we've worked out any boundaries with them like we would do a, a partner. And I was thinking about the fact that I normally understand relationships as being kind of two-way things. Um, and it led me to think like whether my phone loved me um, as well as whether I love my phone and, <laughs> uh, and, and then what like some kind of physical representation of that might be. I don't really know. I was thinking about the moment when I'm looking at my phone and it's on 1% and I'm like trying to get it to do something and it's like going red and it's like there's this sort of tension between us of what it wants and what I want and... Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you'd thought at all about the kind of the two-way relationship. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet. Um, what, as in, does your phone love you? Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, we need to love our phones more. And then you can, like, if you... I was thinking of, like, some of the behaviours. What would... How would your behaviour change if you loved your phone? So, like, do you have to put your phone, like, in a little mini bed? Yeah. That's got... <laughs> these are my weird thoughts. And a little... Uh, it's got, like, a little... Um, yeah, you put it to bed, and it, like, cleans, cleans the screen as you put it to bed. Um, <laughs> or, I don't know. I feel like with things... It's a bit like nature. If you want nature to look after you, you have to start the process of, like noticing it, caring for it, and then you feel the benefits. Um, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Um, thank you both for your talks. They were both so interesting. Um, uh, I was thinking, in terms of the archiving and the backing up kind of questions that have been coming up a bit, um, it's a bit dystopian, but I quite, I quite often am thinking about like the end of the internet, just as a thing, because it's just in the back of my, oh, dropping my phone on the floor and not loving it. Um, <laughs> because Chloe just made a face. <laughs> <Did she? laughs> so on point, and I didn't even mean to be. Um, uh, yeah, the end of the internet. Um, it's just sort of in the back of my mind as a kind of general thing, like when we're backing things up, and archiving things digitally, my, my, my thought process always goes the other way and says we need to back things up physically because what if all of this just implodes one day based on no understanding of how it works? But I was just wondering if you ever think about like the physical side of things being like maybe that's the one that's going to last or maybe it's the other way around. But do you have any thoughts on that, basically? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's a good point. I think I was reading recently that uh, like someone's advice to actually make sure that your like photos or emails are really like backed up is to back it up on two different hard drives um, and have it there rather than backing it up on the cloud. Um, I don't know if that's better or not, um, but I think there is. Yeah, it's. I forgot what I was about to say. I had a whole thought process. Um, evade me. Do you have anything else? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I guess I've gone through this process like grieving someone mm. and like I have all these WhatsApps and that's kind of all I have. I don't know who asked the question. I'm not looking at anyone. Oh, hi. Yeah, um, yeah so, and I have um, kind of downloaded all our WhatsApp chats. And I think I might print them out and make like a little book um, just so I have it. Because, um, yeah, otherwise I have lots of photos of them and like music, but the actual little chats, like what if it just goes one day and then I, I can't look back on it. Um, so I'm trying to make things physical as well. Um, yeah. I actually thought. remember what yeah. I was about to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was about printing out, actually, yeah. Um, just uh, another thing I was reading that um, I think the Library of Congress in the States, when it was trying to archive video games, 
as part of the process, they are kind of printing out the first, I think, 10 like pages of code of a game um, in order to kind of preserve some sort of track of it. But then there is, you know, the question is like, is that the code, like if it's not working in a specific environment and the software, you can't replicate it and make it do what it was supposed to be doing. Is that like something else? Have you created just a new like document and a new record that now you have to preserve? But I thought it was also interesting that, you know, that's the way they decided to go with it and be like, okay, you know, print is safer and we can preserve that as print. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of idea of maybe making it into a different format that you can preserve instead. Any last questions for anyone? Oh, we got one online. Two online. Uh, so this one's from Storm Greenwood, and this is to both of you. Um, what part of the research process did you most enjoy for your projects, and what do you hope people will gain from experiencing the work in person? I, uh, I think I'll take this one because she's my partner, actually. I don't know why she asked me this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think, like, I mean, researching all the historical letters um, that I ended up using in, in the narrative was probably the best that I enjoyed the most, um, as well as kind of going through my history of, of kind of messages uh, with Storm <laughs> and deciding what to include. But also finding out this um, kind of incredible, rich history of correspondence between queer women and, like, there is so much joy in it as well mm. because, you know, I was saying there was a time where it was almost impossible for queer women to build a life together. But, and I think I was expecting to find it a more kind of traumatic to revisit this certain history. Um, but it was very joyful as well and it was great to see and to be able to kind of incorporate that. Um, yeah, and I hope that I think tomorrow if people have kind of the time to sit down and read through the narrative, maybe we'll have a similar kind of experience. And what I wanted to do was also hopefully kind of weave a link between kind of historical queer women meeting and corresponding as well as like my experience. And, you know, hopefully there will be a future as well and kind of weaving in this link between um, queer women and queer experiences through history and hopefully make it like remember like by someone in some way. So I think that's it. Uh, there's actually another question for oh, you specifically. For yeah. okay. um, this is from Kat and Kat asks, do you come across the relationship between non-human nature and machines a lot in your research? And if so, do you think you'll create any pieces on it? Non-human nature and machines. Yeah, Non-human nature and machines. Mm. I'm trying to think if I came across any specific examples. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming is that referring to like AI generated things or more like... I think more non-human nature, I'm assuming meaning like trees, the mycelium right. network, etc. Nature structures. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a thing that I've come across a lot in my work. I think a lot of um, what I've been looking at is kind of um, publications that exist only in the digital realm, but mostly generated by like individuals. Um, so often things that are not necessarily have a lot of, um, you know, a big budget behind it and a lot of support and they're not often by, made by big studios but mostly by individuals kind of experimenting with code and creating their own kind of work. Um, but I think there have always been a human on the other side of what I've been looking at, so I don't think I have much experience of it. I'm sorry. Should I talk? You to, yeah, if you like. Um, <laughs> I was recently on like um, a queer ecology course um, online that um, 
went through lots of queer artists and their how they use nature in their work and like I suddenly understood that nature was queer which I've never thought before mm -hmm. and I've only just realized it like with seasons and changing and they there's like a particular flower that in the morning uh, is male and the evening is female like there's nature is really queer um, which I didn't realize um, which seems silly now but um, like having that grounding suddenly makes you want to like open up your connections. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do with that queer family tree of like objects and trying to incorporate phones and technology into that. Like in our phones, there are minerals that are from the, from the soil, um, but I don't yet know how to do that. But I think there's a couple of artists this weekend that are looking at like, mm that connection um, with technology and nature. But I guess that's, like, you pick up a leaf and it's quite easy, I find, to interact and build a relationship. But then a phone seems so separate and like it's sort of designed to be seamless. And I think that's where some of this detachment comes from, um, where I think we can understand nature a bit more because we are part of nature. I'm just blabbing on. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, thank you very much. I think that's probably all we've got time for today. So, join me in giving a hand to. <laughs> and please don't forget, uh, tomorrow at St. Anne's House, there's going to be lots of stuff going on. The few things that you need to book for, I think, are there on the Control Shift website, but also a lot of drop in stuff. Um, and also, the film is. Zata, is it pronounced Zata? Let's say Zata. Sorry, Russell, if you're watching and it's not pronounced <laughs> Zata. Uh, it's on over at Arnolfini until Sunday. Uh, last reminder, there is no talk next week. Please do not turn up. No one will be here. Uh, we're back in two weeks' time. And if you want to stick around in Hot Desk today, find out more about what we do, please come find one of the studio team. Studio team, wave your hands. Here we are. Um, if you're watching online, uh, drop us a line at studio at watershed.co.uk with any questions. Thank you all for being here today, and we'll see you all here same time in two weeks.